Hello, everyone. Today, I'm here with Jason Ray. Jason is the president of Simply Home. And today, we're going to be talking about enabling technology, remote support services, and other really cool things. Welcome to the show, Jason. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, so let's get right into it. What is Simply Home? So at Simply Home, we provide, as you were describing, enabling technology and connect that with the remote support uh, to really enhance and enable opportunities for independence for individuals that we work with. Just a little kind of background to help make that hopefully make a little bit more sense to the audience. Uh, so we got our start as a service provider. So our connected companies historically provided direct care and support for individuals um, in their own homes or in locations where they um, that they owned. And we really saw an opportunity where we could use technology to create some unique outcomes based on two real primary factors. One, challenges that we were facing as a service provider from staffing and funding and those kinds of things where we really needed to find some efficiencies. But more importantly, saw some unique opportunities where the power that technology provides could be leveraged by individuals regardless of their level of ability, um, what challenges they may have, what goals they may have. And we really wanted to find creative ways to make that possible. And so that's been our focus for the last 15 plus years. And it's my understanding you have been serving clients in uh, in over 26, in more than 26, in at least 26 states and over 5,000 individuals have been benefiting by this technology that you're bringing into their world, so to speak. That's true. Yeah, we work all across the country and we've been honored to work with a lot of individuals and families and service providers. And uh, so it's been a really unique journey and uh, we feel like we're still on the, on the leading edge and really just seeing a lot of this take off. So that's pretty exciting as well. So I've heard about assistive technology and uh, devices that help folks to speak with a tablet when they are nonverbal. Um, and I've, you know, a very low tech assistive technology like grab bar grabbers to reach things on high shelves. But when we talk about remote support services, we're talking about something that uses the latest and greatest in, you know, technology to uh, provide support that people hadn't perhaps envisioned it being delivered that way. Can you give us a couple of, give my listeners a couple of examples of what remote support services would look like for uh, the end user who is either living independently or living with in-home support of uh, a human person? Absolutely. So obviously that's going to look really different. Uh, and one thing that I want to underline and make sure that is expressed in our conversation is that anything that is done from a technology perspective really needs to be done in a person-centered way and not in a technology-centered way. We do see mistakes and challenges that are made because of some cool new shiny object and people want to go find a problem for that to serve. Um, but at the end of the day, we really want to understand what are the unique needs, abilities, challenges, preferences of a person, and then fit the right technology to that. So we wanted to make sure that we underline that as a really key component to technology. But in terms of some specific examples and kind of what that really looks like and means. So a lot of the technology that we utilize and that are a component of this kind of remote support and enabling technology world are things that are pretty common in a lot of homes. So everything from video doorbells and voice assistants to things like motion sensors and door sensors that may be commonly used in like a home security or, or alarm system. So again, it's, can we leverage some of those technologies that have existed for a while, or maybe some of them are newer and really cool, like a, a voice assistant, uh, but the application and the service side is where it's really differentiated. Um, there are some technologies that are still pretty unique to the populations that we serve. Uh, so things like sensors in someone's bed or on a stove or those kinds of things. Um, so really there's, there's really hundreds of sensors and devices that are commonly integrated into a home environment. And most of them are not even really seen. And in a lot of instances, don't really take any kind of interaction on the part of the person being supported. 
Um, so there, there are things that just collect that information passively. So the technology will know somebody has turned their stove on, has not taken a medication, or maybe they have, has gotten out of bed, has left the home, turned the light on. Any of those kinds of things, the technology can collect that information. And what we really talk about is in that sense, the technology is a natural support. Um, and when we start talking then about the remote support aspect, that's really where the technology then engages with whoever is connected and supporting that person. So that could be a paid caregiver, it could be a family member or a neighbor, um, whoever that's gonna be. That's where that level of engagement comes and the technology is just a, a conduit to either provide that direct interaction. So it could be like a two-way audio video connection um, or it could be, hey, I'm just gonna get an alert about something that happens and now I may be next door and I can respond next door to go check on that person that I'm supporting. So an example would be, let's say there was a concern about me cooking safely and I had some technology in my stove so that if I left my stove on for an hour or if my stove was on and I wasn't actively in the kitchen for let's say 10 minutes, that somebody could be notified about that, right? That's a pretty common scenario that we see. And so if that happens, somebody could receive an automated text message, email or phone call of that situation. So they could then engage with me and give me a reminder, but the technology can also engage with me directly as well. So when we talk about remote support, um, people often jump to, okay, you know, there's gonna be a call center somewhere or, you know, uh, that sort of thing that could be the case. But oftentimes the first point of interaction is with directly, directly with that person who's being supported. So that's another great aspect of some of the technologies that we can utilize is that maybe I don't want somebody knowing that I left my stove on first, give me the opportunity first to manage that. So maybe I'll get a, a announcement over a speaker in my kitchen. Maybe I'll get an automated phone call or a text message myself. It gives me that prompt or reminder that says, oh yeah, I forgot I left the stove on. And now I can go engage with that. Um, but then the technology can also work as a backstop in those situations so that if I don't then go turn my stove off a few minutes later, now my support team could get a notification and engage with me. So there are hundreds of different examples like that in different settings and in, in, with different types of needs and concerns, but hopefully that gives you at least a broad sense of kind of how those parts and pieces connect both technologically and then also with, um, you know, the remote support service side. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Um, one of the things that I've learned interviewing other advocates uh, for this podcast and in my own communities that I work in is that there is a crisis right now in support services in mm -hmm. terms of being able to afford to have people take care of uh, and support people who are unable to live completely independently and who need help with bathrooming and cooking and cleaning and, and, and the facets of daily living. And I know every state manages support human services in different ways, but there appears to be a crisis because you can't afford to pay these folks, these agencies, these nonprofit agencies, where it is nonprofit, can't afford to compete, can't compete with the money these folks can get working in the private sector in less intense roles. It's sometimes cheaper to flip burgers than it is to provide support. So. Mm -hmm. And I've had conversations with people about that. The reason I raise that is that, number one, how does remote, remote support services fit into that? And number two, is there a danger that it could become a crutch where we don't have the required level of human support for a person mm -hmm. who really needs that in the home? Oh man, what a wonderful question. Um, and you really hit a couple of the, the major areas of, of focus um, in this industry. And, you know, both from a funding perspective and from the staffing associated with that, both in, in crisis mode. And I would say that historically, that's always been a challenge. And I don't think at any point in time in this industry, we've had situations where people are overfunded and looking for ways to spend all the money that they have access to. Um, and I, I don't think that there's ever been a time when there's been more applicants than there are opportunities. And, but it has become 
uh, really prevalent over the last number of years uh, based on the pandemic and other situations going on. This crisis has really, really um, gotten extremely challenging for organizations and people who need the service. And so, you know, the role that technology can play in that is obviously really important because it can help meet a lot of the challenges that organizations and individuals are facing of, you know, maybe I can't find someone to provide support for me 24 hours a day, but maybe I can find someone to provide support for eight or 10 hours a day, right? And um, if technology can help fill that gap and the other times that I need support, then fantastic, right? Um, you know, now you can still have that same level of support 24 hours a day potentially, but you don't have to have somebody physically present for that time. Um, so, you know, the examples of remote support help do help address some of the um, efficiency and uh, funding challenges that do exist, as well as capacity building. You know, how can we support more people with fewer staff resources? And, you know, those are really two key areas. And, you know, I think that's another good point you make about how do we also ensure that um, the use of technology doesn't become a crutch for um, the lack of these other resources that kind of uh, continue to persist. And, I, I, you know, also understanding the role that technology plays in all of our lives and the importance of making that accessible to individuals is, is a key component to that. And, you know, a lot, or I would say the majority of people that we work with want to be more independent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so how can we look at all of those factors and really uh, create a new model of support? Um, because as I was, this was actually a, a quote it was said to me by an executive director for an organization that we were working with, people don't always equal, people do not always equal quality, right? And we have this sense of, oh, if I have a person there, I'm going to get quality services, right? You can do that in a really bad way, That's just true. like you can implement technology in a really bad way, right? Um, so the most important aspect, again, going back to the person-centered nature of whatever you're doing, is understanding, you know, what can we do? from a funding standpoint, what can we afford to do? What are the available resources we have, whether that's technology or in-person supports? And what does that person want, right? And hopefully a mix of those things can create a successful outcome. Um, and so I think that has to be an important part of the conversation. And there's a whole movement that has really started nationally about this technology first approach. And I think a key aspect of that and, and you know, really what that means is, is, is that technology becomes a first option for um, any person who has a need. And what that means is it's not replacing other services that um, maybe someone wants or needs, right? But it becomes an option, right? The problem is in too many instances, it's not even an option, right? And so, Again, how can we understand all those variables to create the best possible outcome for that person? And it's going to look different for each person along the way, um, but all of those options need to be available um, because we are in a time of diminishing resources, unfortunately. Um, and we have to recognize that too. And um, hopefully, again, we can get to a, a much better place at the end of the day. So there's a lot I want to ask you, but I'm going to start with the issue of who who pays for this and mm -hmm. who will buy into it. Um, it seems to me that in the United States anyway, it's a real patchwork quilt of government versus nonprofit versus private money that is driving the remote support services and enabling technologies for the end users. And sure. in some states seem to be much further ahead in government support than others. I'm thinking of Tennessee, which has uh, mm. been really, really, um, from what I've learned, really prominent in the, in the, and tell me if you disagree, but really prominent in promoting technology for its service provision for people dealing with disabilities, specifically IDD world. Mm -hmm. Do you find there's a challenge getting 
uh, bureaucracies of all sorts to uh, respect the potential of uh, these services to enhance the quality of care and also to rationalize the the, the costs. Yes, um, for sure. And uh, you know, there's there's a number of challenges, and, and you hit a lot of them. And mm -hmm. you've also done your homework because you you know you nailed Tennessee as a great example of how you can be successful in addressing a lot of those challenges. Um, and like, like I was saying earlier, I, I do feel like we are on kind of the leading edge still of where the use of technology is going to become more ingrained in service provision in, in any way, right? Whether that is someone who has a heart condition and goes home with a um, device now that's connected that can give them real-time feedback or you're remotely supporting someone in some of the ways we just talked about. I think that it, it is all across the board there. Um, but in, in terms of kind of the bureaucracy and the funding side, um, it has been relatively slow and incremental from state to state until the pandemic, right? The pandemic has been a bit of one of those um, moments of really recognizing, okay, we have to do things differently. We don't have a choice anymore. And, you know, I would say that we have seen the number of states looking at adoption since the pandemic started close to double um, since that time. And, you know, states are really taking it seriously now and recognizing that um, this has to be, again, it has to be an option. Again, thinking about that technology first approach, and it's not about how can we take services away or you know replace things. It is can technology be an option to you know help us meet some of these challenges and also meet some of the opportunities that exist. Um, so Tennessee is a great example. Ohio is another great example. Minnesota has been doing a number of things for a number of years. Um, and there's a lot of new states who are really coming on board, Connecticut, New Mexico, Massachusetts, Maryland, um, who really see the value and also see the success that states like Tennessee have had and see that it's possible and that CMS is on board if you, you know, do all your homework and, um, you know, really do things in a thoughtful way um, that you can do some of these things well. And so let's just so stop that, there and talk about yeah. CMS. So some of my sure. listeners won't know what CMS is. And I know you're talking sure. about for the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, Medicare right? Yep. So Correct. Yep. that's the federal agency that uh, provides a lot of funding and it provides the money for the states to provide Medicaid uh, or Medi-Cal Correct. in California, where I'm based. Um, mm -hmm. That's what they do. So tell me about how they're on board. What, what does that mean for I'm an agency that maybe is just hearing about this for the first time or is interested in how are they possibly going to get this to qualify for fed, fed money, federal money? Uh, how, is, how is CMS involved in supporting those, those states and agencies? Sure. I mean, C, CMS recognizes the challenges that states and organizations are having both from a funding perspective and then, you know, the staffing crises and, and other things that we've talked about. And so they recognize that we have to expand our thinking a little bit in terms of, you know, how we're going to provide services. And also, you know, for quite a while now, um, CMS has really pushed home and community-based services, right? So getting away from providing services in large facilities and providing services in the community, right? So right. it really does both um, support and enhance that thinking of providing home and community-based services. And um, so I, again, the role that CMS plays is really not just from a funding perspective, but also from a regu regulatory perspective is making sure that's done in a way that is safe, thoughtful, um, doesn't put people in unnecessary risk and, and those kinds of things. And that's where, as that gets, um, as, that, as that opportunity becomes available, states have to then take that up. So even if, even if the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid are on board with that, a specific state then has to build that into their system to make it an option available for reimbursement 
in their state. Now that's not always true. There is flexibility built into existing waiver Medicaid systems across the country that if an organization wants to look at how technology can be deployed for people that they serve, there are possibilities in different states, maybe not in every service setting, but in some service settings where technology could play a role to create new, more independent outcomes for people that they serve and do it in a more cost-effective way. So it's not necessarily a deal breaker if you're in a state that hasn't adopted a technology first approach and built it into their waiver. We've worked with a lot of organizations where that is the case and they have still found a way to build it into their uh, model. So, yeah, I mean, I can see why it would be so attractive to small nonprofit agencies that have a certain amount of support uh, in home support services that they provide, whether mm -hmm. it's called in home support or supported living services or whatever yep. it's called, where the leverage of being able to manage staffing with, with enhancement of technology is going to be really, really attractive. So, hmm. so yep. when you get pushback from anyone around the reliability of the technology, you know, in a power yeah. failure, am I still going to have these services kind of deal? Yep. Or, you know, uh, is it going to work? <laughs> do you ever get pushback about that? And what do you say to people? That is, if it's not the first question, it's generally the second, and, and it, it flips with who pays for it, right? Right, exactly. Um, those are the those are the first two questions, and um, so yeah, that's obviously a big concern. If you're relying on technology to be a natural support, as we talked about, you want to be able to trust it. But technology is also fallible. People are also fallible, right? No, and so yeah, I know it's crazy, right? <laughs> and um, the thing to recognize with that is. We have built plans and processes to mitigate risk and to make sure that things are done safely and properly when we provide services in person. And technology is no different, right? If you just go to Best Buy and grab a bunch of stuff and throw it in and hope for the best, you are definitely not going to be in a great place when something negative happens, right? Or when technology fails because you haven't done the work that is necessary to ensure that you're doing things again in a thoughtful way. Um, so there's a process that goes into it. And just like you have a plan for if staff doesn't show up and they're supposed to be at Mrs. Jones's house, right? A plan needs to be in place for how you're going to support technology, what's going to happen if, like you said, the power goes out, your internet service goes out, and you aren't able to rely on that technology, right? And that's where the backup plans come in place. Um, so there's a lot of standards, um, best practices that have been developed over the last 15 or 20 years around how do you do that. And then there's educational resources as well. Um, yeah, I'm so going to be um, interviewing a lady uh, in an upcoming episode who is with an organization called Tech First Shift that is mm. involved with education yep. and accreditation uh, for, for this very area. I'm really looking forward to that. Before uh, we get, we're getting near the end and I wanna make sure I ask you about privacy. Has anyone sure. ever expressed, I know that we've sort of, uh, ever, it seems like our society has given up on privacy. You know, we're all mm. connected, wired and everything, but I can imagine there must be some people you come across uh, at agencies or uh, pub members of the uh, community who are concerned about an intrusivity, an intrusion mm. with technology yep. that might not be true with a, a human being coming into their home. Oh, What's your thoughts about that part of it, the privacy yeah. side of it? That's a great point. And obviously nobody wants a Truman Show kind of Oh, right. I remember that movie. You know? <laughs> right? Um, and so privacy is key, right? And right. the thing that we talk about and really stress is you know, there are, are things that are technically possible that are not ethical ways to apply technology. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back to the person-centered planning process and understanding the role that technology should and should not play, right? Is it technically possible to install a video camera in someone's bedroom? Technically possible. Is that an ethical application of technology? Absolutely not. Is it technically possible to have the exterior doors lock on a house when somebody approaches the door that you're worried about leaving the home. Um, 
that's technically possible. Is that an ethical application of technology? No, it's not. Um, and so that gets back to the, the planning process, the, the best, best practices and standards that you wanna put in place of what are the ways that we are acceptable, what are acceptable ways that we can implement technology and what are not? And what are, you know, where are those lines and boundaries um, so that we can ensure that we are doing things in a way that respects someone's dignity and privacy? Um, can we use things like two-way audio video communication? Absolutely, but we wanna ensure that um, the person supported has the opportunity to make that choice and whether or not that needs to happen and to shut it off if they don't want it anymore. And you know, all of those kinds of things need to be thought about and discussed and planned for before technology is ever implemented. Um, so, you know, the, the planning process is super important. Um, and having those standards and best practices are, are really, really important. And how long have you been in this role? So me specifically, I've been doing this for about 15 years. 15 um, years. Wow. Yeah. What keeps yeah. you up at night? Oh man, pretty much everything we've talked about so far today. Um, you know, uh, and you know, all of those things that we've talked about that are challenges. I mean, we are honored to have the opportunity to work with some amazing people and to do some amazing things to create opportunities for independence in their lives. Um, and that comes with a great level of responsibility, right? We want people to rely on the services that we can provide. And we want to continue to really utilize a lot of the newer technologies as they become available. So kind of staying on, um, you know, what with what is the next thing that we can, you know, utilize in support of someone, staying up with the newest technology trends and implementing those. I mean, um, we're, we're lucky to have a really strong and amazing product development team internally who is always continuing to push the envelope and build new great things and so you know there's a lot of things to keep me up from some of the challenges that we face and then also there's a lot of great opportunities and things that you know our to-do list of stuff that we want to go build and do is like infinite and yeah i completely so, feel your pain i've got a know. laundry list of things that i want to do and i just can't get to it in a time frame that isn't so jason 15 years what is it that brought you to this and why are you why have you stuck with this world for 15 years what what drives you well so i was lucky enough to have a connection with our family um, my, my parents actually had founded a provider organization over 30 years ago um, that provided direct care and support for thousands of individuals. And um, it was actually one of my parents' initial ideas of how do we do this different, right? How do we just not accept the way that we've always done things, particularly as we're supporting more and more people in, you know, a, a more broad area right it was just not a sustainable model to continue to think that even back in the late 90s and early 2000s as they were developing this idea to think that we could support thousands of people across a larger geographic area based on the staffing that was available and the funding that was available so um you know i was lucky enough to have the opportunity to help solve that puzzle Right? How do we really do that? And um, you know, that's kind of where it all got started, and that's where we continue today. Uh, like I've said a couple of times, we're still on the front end of where we see this industry going. Um, a good friend of mine, who's also in the industry, talks about how the technology movement that we're currently in is very similar to the deinstitutionalization de movement of the '80s and '90s. Um, where it really does fundamentally change the way that services and support are delivered. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, that's, that's really just now taking hold. And so that's, that's pretty exciting. So if any of my listeners want to learn more, not just about Simply Home, but about how they can uh, provide these types of supports, um, how would they reach out? How, 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 
what's the best way to get in touch with you and 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 your organization? Sure, we have a very in depth website. Uh, we got a lot of resources in there, and one thing that we have tried to focus on with our web presence is to be a resource. We really don't try and make it a sales pitch. We want to provide resources and information um, so that even if we're not a right fit in a situation, that at least that person has enough information to take the next step, wherever that may take them. Um, so if you just go to simply-home.com, so simply home with a dash in between the simply and home.com, that's our main website. We have YouTube videos and all kinds of resources there. Um, Shift, the organization that you talked about, they're another fantastic resource, particularly for organizations. We've worked with them extensively and think they do great work. Um, so I, I would go there. And as you mentioned a couple of times, every state is going to have a little bit different approach to this. So kind of knowing uniquely where someone is and what some of the options are would probably be another great place to start. So speaking with whether it's case managers or funders or whoever may they may be connected to in their area about what are the possibilities around funding technology where we are. Um, we know a lot of those based on our experience and where we've worked, but we haven't been everywhere. So um, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming on my show today. You know, People, when I mention the word accessible housing to people, and you know, in the context of real estate, people are thinking wheelchair ramps and grab bars. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I love having conversations like this where we broaden the perspective of what it means to have accessible housing and talk about not just how you make it physically accessible, but how you are able to live there not as safely, securely, and be able to be a, remain as independent as possible for as long as possible. So I'm really grateful. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure is mine. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks again for the work that you do. It's a great resource. So thanks a lot. Thanks.